Hey, Matthew. Hey, Tim. What's up? In the movie Matinee, an ambitious filmmaker tries to use the Cuban Missile Crisis as a marketing gimmick to sell tickets to his B-movie monster flick. If this movie was rebooted today, I could totally see Michael Bay trying this. He never misses a explosive opportunity. Tim, I think you're being super critical. Welcome to another episode of the Super Critical Podcast, where we delve into the fun and oftentimes nonsensical way pop culture portrays nuclear weapons. My name is Tim Westmeyer, someone who studies nuclear weapons and works on nuclear nonproliferation and counterproliferation for a living. I'm joined today in the podcast studio over Zoom with Matthew Galt, host of the excellent War College podcast and a writer for Time Magazine and Vice. Matthew, welcome to the show. Tim, thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk about Matinee and Mant today. <laughs> Yeah, we're doing double duty here, right? Because we got a movie within a movie, and we'll be talking about anxieties upon anxieties. Uh, so Matthew and I met several years ago. Uh, we were talking Game of Thrones, dragons, and nukes on the War College podcast. I've also really recently enjoyed the article you had in Vice. I think it was from January of this year, where you helped people learn how to survive a nuclear bomb attack. Now, the only thing I think that's missing from your article, though, is you forgot the number one survival tip, which is, according to the movie Matinee, you know, you lock yourself in a fallout shelter in the basement of a movie theater with your high school crew. Like, that's the main tip. That's the dream, right? Well, I mean, the, these poor people, it's the early 1960s. They're all confused about what you're supposed to do. And only one character seems to realize that, but we'll get into that. <laughs> excellent. So the film we're going to talk about today, Matinee, came out in 1993, directed by the excellent Joe Dante. Some of my favorite movies that he did, Gremlins 2, The Burbs. Uh, I am a, a strict defender of The Burbs. It's got some problematic content, but I still enjoy that movie. Uh, and then Inner Space, which is one of my favorites as well. Uh, you got any particular favorite Joe Dante's? Gremlins 2 has got to be one of the best sequels ever made mm -hmm. to anything. I, I can't believe that that movie still got made. If you haven't seen it in a while, it's much more subversive and odd than than people remember. And I, I, I'm also a big fan of The Burbs. Nice. Uh, the Burbs is fun because it was one of those where like, you, I grew up watching it on like TBS all the time. And then the first time I saw it, like, unedited on a DVD or something, I was like, whoa, <laughs> there's a lot of, they, they cleaned this up a lot for TV. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a different different time these days, because you would just watch this now streaming on HBO Max or something. So Matinee's got a great cast. The main star here is John Goodman. He plays Lawrence Woolsey, a B-movie film director who makes up for his relatively low production standards with his movies with very creative marketing gimmicks. Uh, he's a he's a one-man Alamo Cinema and Draft House. He pays his movies with theater gimmicks like buzzing seats, costumed characters, and much more. We've got Kathy Moriarty, who plays Ruth, who's an actress in a lot of Woolsey's movies, and also his business partner slash uh, lady friend. Uh, she has a Best Supporting Actress Academy Award nomination from her role in the movie Raging Bull, but she was also in Tales of the Crypt, which is a really good experience to get her ready for, for this film. The only other person I really want to mention here is Robert Ricardo, who's the theater owner that we'll talk a lot about here. He's known for playing the Doctor on Star Trek Voyager. So it was kind of fun to see him there. Yeah, most of the cast of this movie is, it's these amazing character actors. Like a lot of the people that you're like, oh, I've seen that person mm -hmm. before, but I can't quite remember what they were in. Uh, a good example of that is one of the tough gentlemen that John Goodman hires to kind of promote the movie. Uh, the gentleman with the tattoos on his arm. I forget his name, but he's in a whole bunch of things. Hmm. Um, and then child actors that you've never heard of ever again. Yeah, the only one that really stands out is uh, Lisa Jacob. Uh, who was one of the kids in Mrs. Doubtfire, and she was also in Independence Day, which is a, a nuke movie that we covered here previously on the show. So according to Rotten Tomatoes, before we kind of get into the meat of the episode here, I always like to kind of preface what at least the critical acclaim was at the, at the time. According to Box Office Mojo, the film made $9.5 million on a $13 million budget. Not particularly great for the cinema, but it, since then has become a cult classic on, on DVD and streaming. Rotten Tomatoes scored it as a 94% fresh, which is not what you would get from seeing that kind of box office return roger ebert really liked it gave it three and a half stars out of four saying quote delightful and surprising comedy that somehow combines the cuban missile crisis with young love and the sneak preview of a science fiction movie about a man who turns into a giant ant matinee sounds unlikely but it works wonderfully well yeah. and i really enjoy it I uh, what, is, what is your history with this film, uh, Matthew? You recommended this one out of the, the mini list of uh, 200 plus movies that I have. You picked this particular one. Have you seen it uh, before? How do you, you know, what do you think about it in terms of a, a piece of nuclear pop culture? I would say that 
a lot of who I am today is because of this movie. Ooh, okay. I did not see this in the theaters, but I remember my parents rented this when it came out. I was probably 12, somewhere between 10 to 12. And it's it's the perfect kind of movie for that age. It's a kind of movie we don't have a lot of anymore. I think the closest analog to something modern would be like Stranger Things-ish. Hmm. Where it's a movie with adult themes and about adult topics, but for kids. Okay. And it's handled well. I think, like, The Gate is another kind of example of the era, uh, if anyone's seen that. This was the first time I remember, like, learning about the Cuban Missile Crisis and learning what nuclear weapons were and why people were afraid of them and, like, what duck and cover was. I, you know, I was so young during the last days of all of that stuff that this movie really drove home how big a deal that was for my parents' generation. I think this movie contains a, a great explanation of why horror works and why ho people like horror fiction and why it's important for a culture. And also one of the great adult, like one of the great secrets of adult life is given away by John Goodman in the ending monologue, but we'll get there at the end. But I, I think that that line is like just so beautiful and so important. Excellent. Well, I'm really glad you picked this one then. We'll flesh out a little bit more of how this ended up influencing what you do and how you think these days. But the two main topics that I wanted to kind of think about when we talk about this particular uh, movie is one, you know, what does this movie have to say about the Cuban Missile Crisis as an event? It's certainly not the point of the film. Uh, the point of the film is to talk about uh, B-movies and other things like that. But what is, you know, what does it have to say about it as a backdrop uh, about the end of the Cold War? Because, you know, this movie was, you know, probably in production right around the time and when the Cold War ended, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed. So that is a very interesting time period, 1993, to release a movie about you know, anxieties during the Cold War. So I want to get into that. Uh, and two, you know, what does the Cold War and nuclear tension, like, what does that particularly allow for a productive comedy? Um, I may compare this to another movie that we covered on the podcast, like Blast from the Past, which takes a very similar discussion about the Cold War, but mix it with a Cuban Missile Crisis and a comedy. How does this film strike that balance very well? Does it do it well? And how does it combine existential crisis with, with comedy? Let's get into the plot of the, the film itself. As usual, spoiler warning, if you haven't seen this movie uh, i didn't see it on any sort of streaming service except for like amazon prime for purchase it's on dvd you can get it for like less than ten dollars there's a lot of those available i rented it for a couple bucks on amazon prime is how i rewatched it but that was the only i mean yeah, i think you can do it on youtube but other than that it's not just available on any streaming service but it's a couple bucks to watch it on amazon and i think it's well worth your time i think this movie's great good yeah well hopefully this we'll see this one pop up somewhere um because john goodman is a he's still a pretty big star he, this is this should be out there how could such a thing happen, Dr. Cabal? The ant's saliva must have gotten into Bill's bloodstream and gone straight to his brain, just as the radiation, which is measured in units called Rentkins, was released. And that's how he became a... Mant. Gotcha! For the kids of Key West, Florida, there was nothing scarier than a monster matinee. Lawrence Wolsey, the master of movie horror, exterminates you with... Mant! The story of Matt is based on scientific fact, on theories that have appeared in national magazines. But in the fall of 1962... A series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on the island of Cuba. They got the biggest scare of all. They're gonna bomb us? The country is on red alert. And what a perfect time to open a new horror movie. That'd be the best show to take a girl to. The whole world's gonna blow up anyway, so we should just do whatever we want. You know, last guy she went out was in her farm school. He did teach me a lot. What about? About my body. You think if the bomb were about to fall, she'd do it with me? <laughs> Wait till you see the feelers on this thing. Uno, dos, one, two, tres, cuatro. Some of it's stage lighting, some of it's magic show stuff, but the big studios, none of them have anything like it. You never, ever turn one above six. This is it! From Joe Dante, director of Gremlins. You see what he's putting back? The showmanship. The bombs are falling! You think this is some kind of picnic for me? I'm still concerned about that bomb thing. A little question of taste? No, no, but your younger patrons, you could have some seat wetness. John Goodman. I love this business. Matt Nay. Man, I'm seeing this twice. 
So the movie starts immediately with a mushroom cloud right in your face, so I'm on board. We see shots of probably the Apple II test and some other nuclear detonations that show model homes and other things being destroyed in the blast of a nuclear test. This famous stock footage that everyone has always yep. seen of the house being blown down and destroyed. Like, we've all seen this. If you've seen any nuclear anything, it's in there. Yeah, it's, it's just perfect B-roll. Um, one of the movies we covered on this, on this podcast, uh, you ever seen Six String Samurai? Uh, it's on my list. I know I need to see it, but I've never watched. Now that that one is just completely available on YouTube. Um, it's wacky. It's really fun. And of course, the the movie has to start with a nuclear premise, and it just shows almost the same footage as this. It just shows Apple II. It shows a few little nuclear tests and things. Uh, so that's trying to set up where where we are. It's 1962 in the film. We meet B movie horror filmmaker Lawrence Woolsey, played by John Goodman. Uh, it's, he's kind of like direct to camera, talking to the audience, kind of like a trailer before or maybe after one of his other films, where he talks about the horrors of the atomic bomb yes the atomic bomb is terrible but more terrible still are the effects of atomic mutation hello i'm lawrence woolsey and i want to warn you about something that could happen if a man and an ant were exposed to radiation simultaneously the result would be terrible indeed for the result would be mant I love a good poor man, too. It's just such a great callback to basically every B-movie that was coming out back then. Mm -hmm. Got some great shots later in the film in the theater where they actually show the, tr the posters for a lot of those movies in the background. But there were so many atomic, just atomic horror movies, right? Oh, yeah. They were, they were I want to say a dime a dozen. They were literally almost every other weekend. There would be mm -hmm. something about atomic uh, culture or atomic uh, energy causing... A man and an ant, a man and a grasshopper, a man, you know, any sort of combinations of stuff. And you know it's all true because John Goodman in the movie says that all of the science has been backed up by, quote, national magazines. I feel I should warn you. The story of Mant is based on scientific fact, on theories that have appeared in national magazines. So I'm not even going to nitpick anything. If he's, if he's got that science to back it up, it's good. So the movie will come out, as he says, at the Strand Theater, which is in Key West, Florida. He says it will be uh, accompanied by Atomovision, which is kind of like a 3D movie with probably with a little bit more gamma rays. So we meet uh, two young brothers, Gene and Dennis. They're living on a Navy base in Key West, Florida. They're very excited. They're the kind of kids that, you know, maybe you were when you were young, uh, Matthew, really enjoying these types of films. And he, they're, they're excited to watch Mant. Gene is the older guy, uh, the other older brother. He's They're both pretty young, but he's kind of mean to his younger brother. Uh, gives him a bunch of fake stories about uranium beetles human hybrids that are going to scare him. One thing I want to highlight in the kind of this opening is this movie does something really clever very quickly. The kids are, they leave the movie theater, they've just seen this grotesque and horrible thing, and the older brother is getting the younger brother all worked up mm -hmm. with these gross stories, and you see them walk onto, they, they kind of get checked into the Navy base, and another one of the kids that lives on base comes up to him and he's got like a little gun. And he's like, hey, I'm going to go down and shoot some frogs. And they're like, oh, <laughs> gross. What's wrong with you? And I just thought that was such a great moment of like, these kids are rooted in this fantasy, but they understand the difference between it and real violence. Hmm. And it's very explicitly done very, very quickly at the opening of the movie. They're, they have uh, a mother and a father, obviously, and they're on the Navy base because dad's in the Navy. And he is, it, it's the very beginning of the Cuban Missile Crisis, although these people don't know that yet. And dad is out to see right and mom is concerned that dad is uh on this new secret mission and is going to be in danger in uh key west was where i my wife and i spent our honeymoon so this movie is very you know near to my heart uh in addition to the new content i didn't necessarily have a problem with ants or any sort of frogs that were coming to get us uh, but there were all these <laughs> crazy chickens pretty much everywhere uh, so i wonder if a, a sequel to this movie could have been some sort of chicken human hybrid uh type thing you know in addition to the kids we, we meet larry Woolsey. he's on a little bit of a road trip trying to get to to key west Florida. It's a beautiful drive. I'm glad he was able to do it. He's particularly excited about um, how the Cold War tensions are really good for the movie business. His business partner, uh, she's not particularly as thrilled as him. She thinks that maybe the picture might flop, but they have this great conversation about how, how you market a film like this, and you know, this is going to be his big break. He's going to bring this big wig from a chain of movie theaters, national chain, and he's going to be able to get his films into... He's like right on the cusp of making his career. It seems like you're going to explode uh, and, get, and get more popular. I, I John Goodman is pretty great in this film. It's this amazing and particular like American archetype that we see in American fiction, like the lovable huckster, mm -hmm. like the huckster with the <laughs> heart of gold. Like this is a guy that's going to full of crap, but we all know it. We kind of love that he's full of crap, right? 
I would argue that John Goodman, more than the kids, is kind of the hero of the film. Oh, yeah. He's definitely going to huck you, but he's not going to hurt you. Yeah. He wants your money, He want, but he also wants to entertain you. Yes. He doesn't want to just show you a movie and you're going to sit there and, and, and enjoy it from the comfort of your seat and your popcorn. He wants to move you, to frighten you, yep. and then let you know that it's okay. Even though he's making schlock, he, like, he believes in this schlock. He, like you know big time fortunately for him you know business is going to be good because we see an nbc news flash president kennedy has given a speech about the deployment of soviet medium range ballistic missiles with nuclear warheads to cuba he announces an embargo on goods uh, to and from cuba and that the united states will not shrink away from soviet threats which is perfect nightmare fuel for the younger brother who's worried about his dad on the ship uh, near cuba having to interdict russian vessels and we're right in the middle of this a lot of the adults aren't really talking about the cuban crisis except for john goodman and he's mostly speaking about it in terms of how it will affect his film it's not like you're getting any sort of like authority figure a military figure talking to the kids it's just the kids kind of chatting amongst themselves about how they would be responding to this given that their their parents are involved kids think they're immortal Mm -hmm. right even even faced down with the nuclear destruction like what's one of the first things the, these the, the kids do is like i think he leaves the little brother he goes and meets up with one of his friends stan and they go down they stand and they go down to the supermarket to watch the adults panic buy stuff <laughs> and you can tell that they're just they just don't care and they're really entertained by all the adults being so frightened like that's that's more interesting to them almost than the cuban missile crisis Yep, joking about, um, I, I didn't see any toilet paper runs, uh, people trying to grab toilet paper in the movie. I, I saw lots of... Uh, they had the fight over the shredded wheat. Yeah. Like those two guys, yeah, Stan's <laughs> dad and somebody else get into a fight over the shredded wheat. Uh, lovely. Um, and then whether or not the end of the world would be particularly good for their dating game. Yeah, of course. So we, we get a, we get an... an I mean, to really nail this uh, particular Cuban Missile Crisis moment home, we're at the school and we have an air raid drill. We get the duck and cover positions like you, you've seen in the Bert the Turtle duck and cover videos. Um, they line up in the hallways, they get on the floor, they put their heads uh, down and their hands over their necks. Now your red meat food group, you want to make sure you have three servings a day to satisfy this food group. Breakfast, you're going to have bacon, sausage, something of this nature. Lunch, a hamburger, pork sandwich, something like this. And then dinner... Okay, people, this may not be a drill. Single file, quickly. You assume a duck and cover position with your head down and no talking. Single file, let's move. One thing I'd nitpick here is, if, is that normally in the duck and cover... Uh, the actual, I think the actual propaganda film, they're supposed to put your body towards the wall in a fetal position. They were kind of sticking their feet uh, against the wall. It's not a particular, you know, it's a little small thing, but one thing that I did notice, but the, the big one was, was that uh, there's one student, her name is Sandra. She refuses to buy into the idea that duck and cover is really going to do anything against nuclear bombs. If you think it's going to help you to put your hands behind your neck when the bomb falls, you're wrong. Well, young lady, I think we've had just about enough of this. That girl's a communist. If you die when the bomb first falls, you're lucky. Because if not, you're going to get radiation poisoning. First your hair's going to fall out, and then you're going to bleed from your intestines, and then you're going to start throwing up. But you're not even throwing up food. You're throwing up your own organs. Ew. Yeah. Ew is right. Principal's office, let's go. But then I won't have the protection of being on the floor if the bomb falls. I said let's go. They don't tell you the truth. They tell you... Put your hands behind your neck and they keep building books. And this is the character played by Lisa Jacob. I thought she was great in this movie. The script is so full of like these great little fast moments where they establish character and do things very efficiently. And this mm -hmm. is another one of them. It's like this is the first time we see this character. And she's <laughs> she is telling the kids in grotesque detail what's going to happen to their bodies even though they're in the hallway like if you guys get hit by a nuke you're going to be vomiting up you're, and it's not going to be stuff that's in your stomach it's your own internal organs as they liquefy yeah right it's just just frightening them it has to get it gets carted away by the adult authorities and like you said <laughs> called a communist i would not have been that kid in the in school um i was not no. watching that many nuke movies at the time uh i would have definitely been the kid that just did the drill and been like trying to keep my head down get to recess uh she's yep. a pretty cool character yeah great character
Gene, because his dad is, you know, one of the people who's on one of the blockade ships, he all of a sudden becomes a little bit more popular in school. People are asking him lots of questions. Everyone's really worried about the killed missile crisis. You see lots of military activity. You see some mobile radar units being deployed on the beach. Surface to air missiles being put onto the beach. Uh, we got that panic run at the grocery store. It seems those people, despite all this chaos, people are pretty still excited for watching the movie Mant. That is not being stopped here at any point. It even gets to the point where you get the protests against this movie. Uh, people aren't concerned as much about the grotesque impact of nuclear detonations. What they're really concerned about are the kids going to have to see something gross on the movie screen. You got to get your priorities in order. Yeah, we, we get this group of people whose priority um, is to protest the film Citizens for Decent Entertainment organization. Woolsey shows up, talks a little bit about how, yeah, I respect your, your rights to protest, but everybody should get a chance to also see the film, and he gives out a bunch of free passes. And I think it's fun. It turns out the... The person who is protesting is actually uh, an actor named Herb Denning that uh, Larry hires in a bunch of his B uh, movies uh, just to kind of gin up controversy, which I thought was terrific. Yeah, it's such a great, like, it's the kind of thing you can see this character doing, mm -hmm. right? Completely, completely keeping and like kind of builds him up as this marketing genius. Have you seen the video with Kevin Smith when Dogma came out? Um, there uh, was a yes. You went down to the protest and was interviewed at the protests. <laughs> yeah, yeah. you tell people they can't do anything, they can't watch this movie or see this thing, they're going to want to. Well, especially right? kids. Yeah, oh, especially kids. So speaking of the kids, we get this subplot here uh, where the other friend, Gene's friend, Stan, him and his hopeful, he's hopeful that this person is going to be a lady friend for him. Uh, they talk about their relationship, taking it to the next level before the bomb drops. And then we get this other character, uh, kind of a, an ex-boyfriend of the the lady i forget her name i'm sorry uh but it's a, a greaser character named harvey he kind of looks on from a distance very sad her name is cheryl cheryl thank you i didn't really get this subplot you have some thoughts on this a little maybe i don't know if we want to drop this stuff but uh this this is important because harvey becomes more of a character a little bit later on but there's this other subplot of in addition to sandra and Jean, you also have stan and his lady friend and harvey also in the mix here yeah i think it's i i think i can explain why this is in the movie it is the weakest subplot and it's a little weird because one of the things that's weird about it is like the kids are what like 13 mm -hmm. 14 and cheryl has been dating an older boy who we later see drinking in a bar oh yeah that's right and he is obviously like 18 19 so that's like one weird aspect the other <laughs> thing is he's like a juvenile delinquent right he's the product like leather jacket pompadour hair white shirt uh, another kind of movie he would probably be chain smoking mm -hmm. but he writes poetry <laughs> here's here's my take on this is like this is a movie about uh fear and how people like in communities react to fear and how they process fear and like how they get over it and like get through it and, like what, what how the ways they see catharsis mm -hmm. um and it's playing with a whole bunch of different real and imagined fears at the time well something we i think we forget is that there was a moral panic uh in the 1950s and 60s around juvenile delinquents and they thought literally that if you read certain kinds of comic books and watch certain kinds of movies, it, it's basically the line that those protesters feed is that, you know, if you watch this stuff, it'll turn you into a murderer. Uh, it'll make you commit crimes. He's supposed to be kind of the stand in for like what happens to you if you keep watching this, like what they imagine hmm. happens to you if you keep doing this stuff. Also, importantly, this is a weird detail that I think is meant to highlight this. Uh, his last name is Starkweather. And Starkweather is the name of a famous like spree killer who went on a rampage in the Midwest, I believe is the Midwest, uh, in the 1950s with his girlfriend, who was 14 at the time, Ooh. whose name is Carol, similar to Cheryl. She was actually, I think, the youngest woman tried for uh, first degree murder in American history. And I think that they're supposed they're like trying to reference that. It doesn't quite work. Mm -hmm. it's a, that's a, that whole subplot is very odd but i think that's what they're going for that's my my theory I, i'm convinced that makes that makes some sense it sometimes feels like a bit of a distraction from the other in a piece to the story but um that is that does add a, a bit more of a, of a layer because at some points harvey is kind of seen to be this dangerous person you should be concerned about and other times mm -hmm. he's just as you mentioned he's a poetry writing kind of goofball um later on so it's a fascinating kind of mix there well, we'll have to see how, where his where his role in the story is as we get to keep going through this. 
Gene tries his luck at befriending Sandra, the the air raid protester that from his school. Um, she and him have this, I think, a pretty, speaking of kind of things that are really different from the rest of the movie, they have a really good conversation where she makes a lot of salient points about how, well, you know, you're concerned about your dad, but, you know, we're also dehumanizing the Russians, which is making it a little bit easier for us to be okay with potentially bombing them. And it allows Gene to really reflect a little bit on things that he probably never even thought of you know, before. I thought that was really interesting. It makes the movie very more well-rounded. You know, what do you think about some of these kind of serious moments in this comedy? They all work shockingly well, mm -hmm. right? And again, it's one of these things where she's, where she's like, you know, we, we unperson them to make it easier to kill them. She explicit, she just like explicitly says it. I think you have to think about like the national mood at this time specifically. And I think this speaks to maybe why, why this movie didn't do as well as it maybe would have five years earlier, maybe mm. even five years later is because we didn't want to think about this stuff anymore. We had resolved all this stuff. We don't want to be reminded of it. Even though it is a movie kind of about like coming out of the movie theater into the light and not being afraid anymore, the movie is constantly there kind of goading you and asking you to think deeper about these nuclear issues and about the way America conducted itself during the Cold War. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not overt, but it's there. De and it's definitely a running theme in the movie, and I think they handle it well. And I think she, uh, like, she delivers those lines very well. Yeah. Um, and it, and it's again a kind of like I said earlier, the movie is very efficient. This could have been a very bad scene where, like, say she takes him to her parents' house, and you get introduced to them as anti-war activists, and there's a longer speech. But they don't do that. They know that all they need to do is kind of plant that seed in your head and move on. Right. It, the movie is great and you can really see the how well it was written for this purpose and it, it is interesting to me for the film because it, you bring up a really good point that the fact that it, it came out after these anxieties had kind of peaked and people were ready to kind of move past them it'd be a bit if the movie contagion came out a few months mm -hmm. after say a covid vaccine came right. out and people are like okay i'm ready to move past this i don't necessarily need that anymore that anxiety yep i don't need the catharsis that would be brought on by watching this get resolved right like i don't need that anymore Gene meets up with Larry Woolsey because uh, he's a big fan of his and his movies. Uh, he he admits that he, hey, I, I think I know that this Herb Denning guy is not really a protester. And I, I think uh, John Goodman is pretty excited that this kid figured this out and kind of brings him a little bit under his wings and starts to use him to help promote the film. Uh, he, we, we walk around. Woolsey shows the different electronic shock machines that they're going to put into the seats to freak people out. We're introduced to the theater owner. Um, he thinks this is a little bit too much uh, to scare people with the bomb scare that's currently happening uh you can see he's a particularly paranoid guy probably paranoid's not right because this is a real concern but he's particularly attuned to these concerns right he's walking around with a conelrad radio which is the kind of the station you would turn to on your radios to get uh those kind of early warning civil defense type messages he's got it tuned to the bomb concerns uh and this really intrigues woolsley he's he really thinks this is a really good time to release a, a horror film he's right box office receipts for horror fiction in times of turmoil go up hmm. we love to watch a scary movie to distract to like help us process the the scary things that are happening outside of our door like all the really big horror movies heck, always tie back into some sort of cultural anxiety at the time mm -hmm. the the easiest one to bring up is um invasion of the body snatchers it speaks directly to america's anxieties around Communism, fifth in the fifth column in the 1950s. The Exorcist is about not being able, like being afraid of what your children will become and a loss of, like a, a fear of a loss of religiosity in public life. Uh, so he's he's right. Like th that's a great time to release a horror movie. The bet is all the bet is almost always safe. And what gets more uh, in terms of concern and anxiety than, you know, global thermonuclear war? John Goodman points this out really directly. Tom O'Vision. Rumble Rama takes a lot more to scare people these days. Too much competition. Now they got bombs that'll kill a half a million people. Nobody's had a good night's sleep in years. So you gotta have a gimmick, you know, something a little extra. This is also the scene, if I remember correctly, where he he basically breaks down the philosophy of like why we tell scary stories, right? With the mammoth, mm -hmm. the cave painting of the mammoth, which is like this beautiful animated scene. Where he's like, you know, we're going to go hunt the mammoth. Everyone's afraid. Some guy paints it on the wall. He gives it bigger teeth. He makes it as terrifying and as frightening as possible. And then, you know, after he's done with the story, you ex you 
you, you, you turn the lights back on and everyone's, the monster is defeated and the story, everyone can go about their lives. And that's what a lot of these atomic films were about, was taking this kind of existential fear and personifying it in the form of a mant or a man gator or whatever it was. And then by the end of the movie, the monster's defeated. You know, mankind overcomes the atomic threat as personified by this creature. And then we move on. And everyone's a little bit less anxious. His way of, for this particular movie of, of scaring people, getting them uh, even more on the edge of their seat uh, so they can get shocked by the edge of their seat, is he hires Harvey, the, the, the guy we talked about earlier. He gets hired to dress up uh, as the Mant himself and work with the in-theater special effects controls, like the shock machines, the, the rumble maker. You get a sense that he really doesn't necessarily know what he's doing, but he's being hired to kind of handle all of the fun effects. Uh, with with the show itself. Matthew, have you ever been to one of those uh, 4D movies where they do these kinds of things, where you, you sit in a seat and it moves you around? Um, I did that recently when I watched John Wick 3, and I kind of have mixed feelings about it. I'm not a, I'm not a fan uh, yeah. <laughs> of, of this kind of stuff, but I also understand like why it happens. First of all, I'm kind of curious what you thought of the 4D John Wick experience. There was some good moments where you, it's hard to... <laughs> So there are moments where you hear like a gunshot, you know, there's lots of headshots in, in John Wick. And anytime a gun would go off, there would be a little bit of a, whoosh, like a, like a wind that would go by your ear, which was pretty cool. There were moments where say John Wick would, would stab someone in the shoulder or John Wick would get stabbed in the shoulder and you would feel like a, a peg on your shoulder that would pop. So there were moments like that that were really That's interesting. Wild. But the problem was, was that it wasn't consistent about whether or not you were John Wick feeling the things happening to John Wick or whether you were one of the six or so thousand people that he kills in that movie, uh, whether you were not one of them. So you're basically feeling everything, which to me meant that I was really not experiencing anything. It was just lots of moving around. I also couldn't figure out because we came in the movie a little bit late um, that there were seat belts that you would put onto your seat. <laughs> um, I could not figure out the seatbelt thing. So I was constantly almost being flung out of my seat. Uh, so that was part of it, but I would have liked to have seen it in a movie that maybe, maybe was like one of the fast. For it? What's that? Yeah, something that was more like designed for it a little bit. What was your experience like with those? Uh, I mean, it's similar. These are all these are all gimmicks, and they have existed since the time of Mant, uh, and they exist for a very specific purpose. And the movie tells you why they exist. Uh, there's there's it's but it's again a very efficiently delivered. There's a banner at the movie theater outside below the marquee that says Fight Pay TV. Hmm. So the reason that there are theater gimmicks, the whole reason that there are widescreen movies, the whole reason that, that people like Wolseley were doing things like this, because he's based on a real person named William Castle. Uh, it's like a direct one-to-one. -one. In a lot of the tricks and things that you see him use in Mant, where he's got people dressed up in suits and he's shocking people from the seats, are things that William Castle actually did in his movies. But these are like when people start buying televisions, attendance at movie theater drop. And so what happens is the movie theaters constantly had to figure out ways to keep people engaged. One of them were these kinds of gimmicks, but they're like harder to mass produce, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is where we get widescreen. The movies go widescreen because they need to fight television. You remember in the early aughts when suddenly all the movies, all the big action movies were in 3D? Mm -hmm. Well, it was because suddenly everyone could buy cheap widescreen TVs and have those at home to watch their movies on. And then you started getting 3D TVs. and Yep. And so now you've got like 4D experiences with movies like john wick and so the these i i thought this was a very just a little nod to like the history of theater or uh, movies and and the kind of the war with television um was to see the see this stuff which i think it's neat to see goodman kind of embody william castle who's this interesting schlock figure who inspired uh people like alfred hitchcock Hmm. There, there's a great like the first that first shot you were talking about earlier where john goodman's in profile and he's got the cigar in his mouth is like that's a shot of it that's hitchcock yeah hitchcock when he would you know, he would you know there that's a famous shot of hitchcock so this is a good movie this is a really good movie. It, it is uh and speak, speaking of hitchcock a, a movie that we're going to cover on the podcast relatively soon uh, was one of his that he uh, talked about nuclear topics. It's one of the absolute very first movies that ever dealt with nuclear issues. Uh, it's called Notorious. There's a, a subplot that he was starting to write before the uh, Manhattan Project was revealed about uranium and, and uh, mm -hmm. uranium, um, you know, as a product that could be used for an atomic bomb. It's fascinating. Uh, we're going to cover it at some point. But I was hoping that there would be more movies that he would cover on this topic. But he was, you know, this, his particular time was not at the same time uh, when this stuff was coming out. I believe he got in trouble 
two with mm-hmm. the State Department, if I remember correctly, when that movie was in production. Yeah, they were wondering whether or not he got access to like leaked information, but yeah, because some of the information in it was 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 too on the nose. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that'll be. I'm looking forward to covering that one. So back to the film itself. All of these kind of scary moments really works on Gene. Uh, he has a mushroom cloud nightmare. Uh, I thought this was a pretty you know scary scene for a movie like this for the kid. Uh, it reminded me of a, a similar scene that we covered in a film called um, Amazing Grace and Chuck, which is about a kid who protests um, nuclear armaments in the United States around the world by refusing to play little league baseball, and then a bunch of other professional athletes join in uh, and ag- and agree to not also play. He has this nightmare about his family being vaporized in a nuclear attack after he visits a silo, a missile silo on a school trip. Um, I thought it was pretty good. It, it really shows the, the fact that this kid is having not just usual anxieties. I'm sure a lot of this is also based on his relationship that he's forming with Sandra, who's talking a little bit more about the, the concerns that he should have had. But, you know, as a kid, you don't necessarily know that unless you um, are exposed to it on a more direct level. No, and I think it's, it's because we see like three, we see a mushroom cloud three times in this movie, mm-hmm. right? And this is the second, the scariest. This is the most, like the one that's happening in your head is the one that is absolutely the most terrifying. Uh, it's, it's much, it's much scarier than the footage we see at the beginning. Um, actually, I guess there's four because there's one at the very top of Mant, isn't there? You see... Uh, it's, it's scarier than the one you see in the William cat in the, in the Wolseley movies. And it's scarier than the one at the end, which we will talk about. The one that you, uh, experiencing in your dreams is the one that's going to get you get the sweatiest. We're on movie day. It's a Saturday. Uh, it's, uh, the day the film's going to come out. Uh, we're at the theater. We see the, the theater owner has, was more concerned than he normally is about the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, he's upgraded his Conrad radio and now has a bank vault style fallout shelter fully stocked with water, food, a bicycle, um, and a bunch of other goods. Uh, this is really important because he, um, he clearly has, he's ready. I don't know how long he's had this for. He's all set up. He, and the radio that he has is, is telling us about how there was a U.S. pilot that was shot down um, over over Cuba, which is a you know real part of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So things look, things look pretty tense. Gene meets up with Sandra when they're in the movie theater, and then we get this great line where Stan um, calls Sandra the band The Bomb Girl. Isn't that that band, The Bomb Girl, you're with? Which I think is a terrific, yeah. terrific nickname. I wish I had that uh, when I was a kid. Band The Bomb Boy would have been good. But it's it's showtime, right? The movie starts, as you mentioned, with an atomic atomic test site scene, and we were introduced to uh, another character uh, in in the real life. Because we're gonna jump back and forth between the movie within a movie versus the actual film itself. Uh, we meet Mr. Specter, who's great. Uh, I like I love that character. Uh, he's the owner of this um, movie theater chain, and he's excited to see whether or not this will work. If this particular gimmick works, then he's gonna have it on all of his theaters there. And you talked about all these great movie posters. We get to see a few more of those in the background of the theater. Uh, two in particular that a nuclear related uh panic in the year zero as well as a, a film called the night the earth caught fire they have a bunch of other ones that are unrelated to nuke stuff but those are two really key ones right at this big you know climactic point in the film most of the scenes that happen in the lobby of the theater those are the posters that are in the background they're constantly putting those in the background kind of mm-hmm. keep that in the back of your brain we we learn in the movie within the movie mant that mant was not created by this atomic test site you know detonation as normally you would have you know like in the movie them uh which we'll talk about a little bit a little bit later which about is actually about making giant ants trying to to attack people uh it's a real film the guy the main character in, in the mant movie he becomes a mant human hybrid because he was at the dentist getting his teeth x-rayed and at the exact same time as his x-ray was hitting him he got bit by an ant and then he basically becomes like if you ever seen the the fly the fly he's that but an ant yeah. it's pretty great yep it's such a great like the the dentist character is so great. Both of <laughs> both of the both of the quote unquote scientists in the, the yeah. movie within the movie are so great. But just like the this your dentist is breaking down for you how you were poisoned by the X rays and the I think he he like pulls down a chart of the hu- like a bisected human body. He's like, well, you see. The ant spit went right up into his brain, <laughs> and when it got hit by the X-rays, well, it turned him into a man. What 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 dentist's office has that? Um, right, it's great. it's so great. And then the other character we we meet is this guy who um he named Doctor Franken, uh, which is great. Um, he's from the Office of Unforeseen Atomic Events. He says that Mant is super radioactive and can either power a whole city or destroy it. Eventually, we see Mant. 
he grows huge. He starts to attack the world. Um, and then that's when you, when you start to see these moments where when, maybe when he's revealed or he's going to start to attack something, you get the seat buzzers and people jumping mm-hmm. and screaming. Um, you get these screeching sounds, very similar to the movie Them, which has got this whistle sound anytime the ants are appearing. I love I love this film within a film. It's basically entirely ant puns and bad jokes. Uh, it's yeah, there's terrific. so many great like every time the the government scientist is explaining anything, if he uses even if it's not really a big word, he's like uh, he's like, well, you see when when we magnify it, and then he always turns to the woman <laughs> and says that means enlarge and just like and yeah. uh, like with with the ant puns, the the ant the mant picks an ant colony off of their their hearth for some reason. And smashes it on the ground and calls himself the great emancipator. <laughs> oh, Bill, if you could just listen to the man in you and put the insect aside. Insect aside? Where? I want to highlight something before we get too far away from the movie within the movie. All right, so he gets x-rayed, right? And that's what causes the transition. And I think that that's important because it highlights like this our weird relationship with nuclear power and with radiation. There was a very brief time right after the end of World War II, it didn't last very long, where we were in love with the idea of the atom. And we thought that nuclear power and radiation was going to do all these amazing things and cure all these problems to the point where you had all these products that were that were on the market that had little bits of uranium in them mm-hmm. or were slightly radioactive, all this stuff that turned out to be just you know, a nightmare. And so I, you know, we, we laugh now about the idea of a guy getting x-rayed bombarded with radiation from an x-ray and turning into an ant. But we have to remember that, you know, like even when I go get an x-ray, they put a big lead vest on me and the dentist leaves the room, <laughs> right? This is a little, it's a little frightening. And I also, uh, something that there was, there used to be in shoe stores, uh, a, a, a box that would help you figure out if your shoes would fit and it x-rayed your feet and it was of course horrible Mm -hmm. and was not safe and gave people cancer but this was a thing that was just kind of in shoe stores in every in everyday life so there there's this idea that we used to have these these everyday objects in american life that were putting out radiation and were actually damaging us and i think that that speaks to that and it's kind of a, a an aspect of the of nuclear tension we don't talk about a lot mm-hmm. we don't see a lot so i thought it was it was fun for me and with to take the opportunity with mant to highlight that as opposed to just making it another like oh he fell in some barrels of toxic waste or was part of you know he was at a nuclear test site etc yeah, you could have seen if this was done in, you know, that time you refer to the kind of the, the birth of Adams for Peace. This could have been something that a dentist office would have offered as an extra feature. Right. You, oh, yeah, we'll, we'll have you get covered by ants and then we'll radio, you know, we'll do x-rays while you get your teeth cleaned and you'll now be able to be as strong as an ant. Uh, mm-hmm. Or you'll have yeah. uh, you'll be able to smell better. You know you'll get antlers, which are or, you know a- a- antennas, which will be terrific. Um, this could be something you would sell as a bonus feature before we realize that maybe this is not particularly the best. Yeah, yeah. Everything healed by the power of the atom. Mm-hmm. There was there's a there's a brief period there where we thought that. Which is which is what you get in the the Fallout video game series, which I know you're a fan yep. of. That stuff is just kind of chock full with all of those different topics. So we're we're in the movie. We're we're getting this kind of mant uh, different mant scenes where you would have the seats rumble and all of that stuff. But Harvey, because he didn't really he wasn't really paying attention when he was um, being told how to operate everything. He puts the rumble seat on too high. Everyone, you know, particularly the theater owner, thinks that the bombs maybe are starting to drop. The Cold War has gone hot. The theater owner <laughs> runs into his bunker and starts prepping. I love that his his he doesn't even bother to try to save no. the theater full of children. He immediately grabs his fish and goes down to his bunker. <laughs> yeah, his bunker's not you know he's not big enough. It's a, just a, it's a regular vault. He doesn't ha- he doesn't have any concern for anyone else in his life. It's just him. And I also like how his vault is one of those that the bombs are going to start. I'm going to push a button. It's going to be on a timer so the Mm -hmm. door will close and no one will open. It can't open, which is something you do when you're concerned about people knocking on the door and being like, hey, so I've got kids here. Can I come into your radiation vault? And he goes, no, I can't because it's the steering wheel has been removed from the car. Well, in a game of chicken, I can't do anything about it. You're going to have to go away. Great. uh... It's that Twilight Zone episode about this. Mm -hmm. It's absolutely excellent. I can't remember what the name of it, but it's just the shelter. Similar, the shelter. That's right. 
We cover that yeah, on the show. Great it's episode. a great episode. We see Harvey. Uh, he watches Stan and uh, making out in the theater. He, of course, freaks out and in his costume as Mant runs up and tries to scare people, which is what he's supposed to be doing. But he starts punching Stan and Stan runs away and tries to hide Gene and the band The Bomb Girl join him and hijinks ensue but Gene and Sandra the band The Bomb Girl get locked in the bunker and they hear rumbling and they think the bomb has gone off they think that they're the last people on the planet yep of course they might be the only ones that survive and that's kind of sad for a little while for them but of course (laughs) pretty much within two minutes they realize that their only course of action is to repopulate the earth the old-fashioned way um other people let's see woolsley tells the theater owner that the bombs didn't actually fall but now he's upset because those kids are going to be stuck inside the shelter with no air it's one of those things where it adds a ticking clock to the to that particular moment like ups the tension Mm -hmm. but if you like inspect it even a little bit doesn't really work well, it does remind me a little bit of this film. Um, not a lot of people have seen it because it's kind of hard to get. It's called Ladybug, Ladybug. We cover this on the podcast. I think it's from 19... Uh, it's late 50s, early 60s. But it's one of those films um, that we, we covered when uh, a couple of years ago when there was the Hawaii missile scare where we thought mm-hmm. North Korea was... People in, in Hawaii thought North Korea was attacking them with a nuclear weapon because they all were told so. They got a text message that alerted them that this was coming. It turns out it was a mistake. Um, but the movie Ladybug, Ladybug is very similar. Over over Conrad, a school is told that a bombers are incoming and then they need kids need to get home to be with their families in the event of the, the bomb happening. Turns out the whole thing was, was a false alert, but the kids don't know that. And the story is about the kids walking with their teacher home and them kind of discussing what's happening. And the movie very sadly ends with a child trying to save themselves from the bomb. They were being denied uh, access to a shelter that a friend had, so they hide in a refrigerator. Refrigerator door closes, and uh... we don't really know whether or not they're, they're rescued, but likely not. Yeah, I mean, that's... You know, there was the big campaign, I think certainly when I was a kid, to make sure that no, you never yep. went into a refrigerator, right? Because you couldn't open it from the inside. And it was a, you were dead, essentially. That's terrible. Yeah, it, Ladybug, Ladybug, you can find it a couple different places. You can buy it on like old movies, kind of like B-movie websites. Mm-hmm. Um, you can maybe get like a DVD with a couple different films together. Uh, Ladybug, Ladybug is really terrific. One of the best examples of, of nuclear pop culture I've seen. But fortunately... It doesn't get that far with the oxygen levels. Uh, Sandra and Jean's parents show up. Uh, uh, Sandra's parents are really great. Um, they're, as you mentioned, they're anti-war activists. Him and Jean, Jean's parents, they show up. They free the kids. They find out some way to open up the doors. Um, and then they, get, they yell at them for making out. But, of course, this gives the idea to Shirley and Stan. They run over to Stan's family shelter to do likewise. <laughs> Knowing that the bombs aren't there, but, you know, they're, it seems like a right. good place to set the mood. And everyone flees the theater. Well, I think I think there's a couple important things here I think we should highlight. Mm-hmm. One, before that, uh, Starkweather grabs Shirley and is threatening her. And what does he threaten her with? He threatens her with a, uh, a pot, like a, a quick action knife, mm-hmm. um, which is the like the the signal of a juvenile delinquent right <laughs> whenever you think that you, you know they pop out their their pop knives also the theater is collapsing because the rumble vision's going too loud right or going too big and the whole the whole thing's coming down and they have to get everybody out of the theater but they know they can't just turn the movie off because the kids will just get mad so what do they do they make them think that the blast has happened mm-hmm. by projecting a mushroom cloud onto the screen and making them think the theater's on fire like Woolsey. The hero uses <laughs> his charlatanism to save the lives of a hundred children. Yep. And while at the same uh, time, the movie within a movie, they're debating whether or not to drop an atomic bomb on Chicago to destroy Mant. It's just a lot of yeah. a lot of nuke discussions happening in, in, at the same time. I'm not particularly sure you can yell atomic fire in a movie theater. I'm pretty sure that's not allowed. It depends on what state you're in. Oh, yeah, yeah. Florida, yeah, right. It's different. Yeah. Yeah, you're fine. It's Florida. It's the 1960s. They were, you were okay. Perfect. Um, So the, the big thing is that the balcony, in addition to everything else, the balcony is about to collapse. Um, But and that's where I think it's um Dennis, the younger brother, is up there really enjoying himself. Uh, So they have to, you know, there's a lot of big stuff that happens here really quickly. Uh, all the people who leave the theater after the the, the the fake bomb goes off, they're all really excited at the world fun ending, uh, that everything's okay. Gene and Sandra, they save Dennis from the menace of the uh, collapsing balcony. Uh, Mr. Spectre is really excited about how well everything went. Uh, he wants to bring... Uh, Woolsey's atomic tomovision to his theaters, but he says with a little less atomic bombs and more ghosts. 
we're going to have a different type of anxiety here. Uh, the Cube Missile Crisis is over. Gene's dad is coming home. Gene and Sandra start dating. Ruth, and uh, which is the business partner of uh, Woolsey, they get engaged. And then the movie ends with uh, Woolsey giving this terrific monologue about uh, the, the world and movies and, and, a, and really a great way of wrapping up the film. So I think that like all the great secrets of the movie are contained kind of in its last few minutes. So as when everybody gets out of the movie theater, and everyone realizes that they haven't been nuked, everything's going to be okay, and it's the middle of the day. That's the best part of going to any scary movie, mm -hmm. I think, is the moment when you leave the theater and the spell is broken, and you realize that the monster's been defeated, everything's going to be okay, and you just experienced something as part of this. Of uh, You get to breathe the sigh of relief. And I think that like after the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, and you know after the collapse of the soviet union in america at least there was that moment on a grand scale everyone breathes a bit of a sigh of relief and then john goodman talks to the kids before he leaves and he gives away one of the great secrets of adulthood uh, which is that grown-ups are making it up as they go along just like you are um, which i think is important that's one of the really striking things the more you dig into the history of nuclear weapons um, and how diplomacy has gone, especially like if you read a lot of the, the stuff about the way that diplomacy was conducted during the Cuban Missile Crisis specifically um, and what, who knew what, when and what people were asked to do and what was going on. Adults are really flying by the seat of their pants. The people that are in charge, the people that are in power, the people with the know-how often are also just kind of making stuff up as they go. Just kind of with this huge, awesome power that they have to destroy cities and lives, they're a lot of them are flying by the seat of their pants. And that's scary, but I think that's an important lesson to remember about nuclear weapons specifically and militaries in general. Um, stuff is a lot more chaotic than you think it is. And that's something that, like, as I've read books and as I've learned more about this, that's something that's really kind of shocked me and how lucky we've been so many times. And then John Goodman and Ruth are in the car. And I just want to shout out Ruth's performance. No, in she's great. Movie. She's amazing. And, like, the contrast between... Because she's in the movie within the movie, too. Uh, the contrast between her in real life and then her in the movie within the movie are just amazing. In the movie within the movie, she, she does this amazing job of portraying an actress that's phoning it in. Mm -hmm. And like, that's hard to yeah. do believably. And she totally pulls it off. Like you can tell that this is a person that doesn't want to be in this movie within the movie. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> Ruth and Woolsey are driving off. Um, and he talks about like the looks on those kids faces it's like their whole life got called off and then bang, it's back on again. And like, how many times did that happen during the height of the cold war, you know, across and not, not just in this country, but across the world where people thought, well, this is it, especially during the Cuban missile crisis. This is we're we're done. It's over. Mm -hmm. um, and then suddenly you have to process life, not only your life being over, but like civilization on a grand scale being over. And then boom, suddenly it's back. And I, and we talked about this earlier, but I think one of the reasons that this movie, this movie is fantastic. Um, and does this, does this thing that I think is really hard to do, which is that it's sweet and it's good natured without being like maudlin and overwrought. Hmm. Right. It's a kind movie. It's got some weird, gross stuff in it, but it's but it's for a purpose and it's fun and it's generally kind. And I don't see a lot of movies like that that are good these days. And this one is. I don't think it did very well because we were at the beginning of, quote unquote, the end of history, right? The Pax Americana. This like very brief period in the 90s where everyone thought everything was going to be okay forever. Nobody wanted to think about this stuff anymore. We were already the people in who have just gotten out of the movie theater had breathed a sigh of relief. We were all in our cars going home, metaphorically speaking. This this stuff was in the past. No one wanted to think about it. It was just like the wrong time for this movie to come out, which is sad because it's good. Right. It's it's better now looking back on it where you don't have to have to put your, yourself in 1993. You can mm -hmm. kind of 
just look at it from a little bit more of a distance is not one of those movies you tend to see in that kind of interwar period between the Cold War and, and 9-11 and the Iraq War, uh, where you would see a film about nuclear weapons that often at that time period was, you know, something about aliens attacking and the bombs would be used for that or it would be, be about terrorism, uh, no yeah. longer this kind of state to state conflict. Like Broken Arrow, just kind of a MacGuffin, right. really, right? It's it's not that. It's something else that draws on those anxieties. But as you mentioned, people were kind of over it. Matinee, which is this weird capstone on that era that is is trying to make you... It's kind of trying to bridge the gap between the two places mm-hmm. and say, like, it's okay to breathe a sigh of relief. Like, the scary stuff is over. We got through it. We always get through it, and we got through it again. Even though we were worried about atomic fire, it's all right. And the legacy of that moment is silly movies about Nance. <laughs> Let, well, let's get right into our discussion questions here. You know, the second one that I had was, you know, how well does the Cold War and nuclear tensions make for, you know, good comedies as, as their backdrop? You know, Blast from the Past is a very similar thing. That's a movie where you've got um, a family who builds a fallout shelter during the Cuban Missile Crisis. Everyone makes fun of them for having a shelter, but they think that there's something that actually the bomb was dropped and these family basically gets stuck in their bunker for, you know, years and years and years. And then they get released uh, kind of by an accident. And the kid who's played by Brendan Fraser, who's just simply like a time capsule person stuck in, in the 1960s, he kind of has to enter the world. And he thought he thinks everything is destroyed, but it's clearly not. But he's got that philosophy. Then the movie ends there. They have to kind of pull the parents out of the shelter and convince them it's okay to come out when they're really not someone like they experienced the end of the cold war they're still stuck and feeling in that anxiety time period and one kind of holding on to that particular piece i i don't know that that comedy i think also works pretty well the movies i think overall pretty entertaining i think these two movies are similar because both movies mock and have fun at the expense of people that are had these nuclear anxieties right and that's part of the process when we go through a trauma like this and i would say that nuclear anxiety is absolutely a trauma Mm -hmm. Um, is that once we're done being afraid of it, it's time to start making fun of it. And you can see this on a micro level with like horror movies in general. Like people were afraid of Bela Lugosi as Dracula in the 1930s. As it goes on, he becomes an object of derision until you get like versus movies, then Abbott and like Costello team up movies where they become comic figures. And so like I see things like Blast from the Past and Matinee as part of the comedic process of us mocking our fears and saying, like, look how silly we were for being afraid of these things. Mm-hmm. You know, I think you and I would argue that we should still be afraid yeah. of them. <laughs> I think I think people should watch threads on a monthly basis, you know. <laughs> right? Stuff doesn't necessarily go away. Yeah, just to refresh, just to refresh yourself. But I think that the culture at the in the in the nineties, I think Blast from the Plast is a really apt example of what both of these are doing. Is really just trying to get us to that that part where we're laughing at all of this stuff where we can we are now free of this anxiety and we can mock it hmm. because you, you've literally got to pull those parents out of the bunker to get them to believe that nothing bad happened right how silly are they right so that's i mean that's kind of how i read that but as far as like nuclear comedies like what's the the i mean the the only like the big famous one is dr strange love right uh-huh. which is is absurd it's almost not a comedy. It's it, I would say it's it's definitely yeah. not, you know, the lines you were talking about, you know, making fun of people's anxieties, you know, why were we still fr- why were we afraid of this? I think strange love is like our approach to this cons- this real world-ending problem is absurdity in terms of our policy and our approach right. to how we think about these things. And pe- no one seems to be afraid of this anymore. Let me just approach it with that same level as I see as an absurdity and I'll just take it a little bit further, uh, but not too much further. So I would say for them, it's more of like a, an existential crisis satire than it is more kind of poking fun at um, why were we concerned about this? Yeah, th- like Dr. Strangelove is you have to laugh to keep from crying. Right, right. It's funny to us now to watch them have a discussion as the bombs are falling about repopulating <laughs> the earth and like making sure that the, the hierarchy is maintained. But horrifying when you're watching that movie in the moment and have like even just an inkling of knowledge of like what was going on, like those kinds of discussions were, it's it's absurd uh, that that was like the solution to it, as opposed to maybe let's find a way to live in a world where we don't actually have these bombs. Yeah. It's funny. Like this is something I talked to Jeffrey Lewis about once about how we, the, the, the state of the world now is that a lot of people actually 
and he knows this because he's he talked to a lot of people about it he mm-hmm. like did a research project you, you take a survey of americans and startling number of them will tell you like oh nuclear weapons i thought we didn't have any of those anymore right like i thought like we had done like that's all done like we don't have them they're gone we've gotten to this place now and i think these movies like blast from the past and matinee kind of speak to the transition period where we don't want to think about them we want to stuff them down we we don't want to think about nukes that it's been bubbling up here and there obviously mm-hmm. in the news as far as concerns go that's the last thing on a lot of people's list could you make a movie like this now where there isn't necessarily that backdrop the concern for people who who study this stuff uh it's still there but there isn't like a cuban missile crisis like backdrop now we have we had the 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 missile alert scare which i'm still mm-hmm. wondering why there I, i've seen different news stories of people wanting to write a film about that particular time period because it but i wonder if the moment's gone people aren't really even concerned and talking about that all that much anymore do you think there is a, a point in time where you know today we could write a film like this um and have that as as something that people would be watching you're not gonna like my answer hmm. i think it will take uh, the detonation of a nuclear weapon hmm. to make people care in a way that a movie like this could get made again. Yeah, I, I think I, I wouldn't disagree with it. I, I think that it has to be something like that. Or for me, it might be at least maybe a resumed of um, open air testing. Yeah, I think that would that would maybe do it. Yeah, which, you know, is is in the offering at the moment. <laughs> right. I mean, Trump would never test a nuclear weapon underground. That would be boring, right? No, no you've got to you have to do it in a way that proves that you've done it. Right. Right. If it's not showing up on Finnish monitoring systems, then it didn't happen. <laughs> so you've got to make sure that it does. You know, and maybe I'm fine with not having a, a new uh, threads um, if it, if that's what it takes um, is to have something like that happen. But people occasionally try, you know, there is a every once in a while there'll be a new film where this is a backdrop. But really, it's often more of a MacGuffin type scenario these yeah. days anyways. The, like when we think about comedies involving nukes, the only other things that kind of like churn to mind are the trauma movies, mm-hmm. which are like these weird sh- like Nuka High and the Toxic Avenger, which again, it's more about like those are MacGuffins to give characters superpowers more than they are movies about nuclear waste or nukes in general. Well, the next movie I'm going to be recording on uh, two days from now is going to be an episode on Spies Like Us. Which is a that a comedy with Dan Aykroyd and Chevy Chase, uh, where they're bumbling yep. spies trying to solve Doctor, Doctor, Doctor. 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 It's a great Doctor. scene. Yeah, that uh, I mean, they're, they're those kind of films. But again, those aren't movies about nuclear weapons. They're just they're they're spy movies with a nuclear MacGuffin. But it's still something with you know that as a particular plot point, um, where they do try at the end of the movie to make nuclear war a little bit funny. Well, and it's also the nuclear like I I don't know if this is a com- it has comedic beats. But I don't know if this is a comedy. I think this is, the, like I said earlier, this is the kind of genre we like don't really have anymore, which is like adult movies for kids. Hmm. And it's got comedic beats and the kids are at the center of it. And it's about their adventure against the backdrop of this terrifying thing that they all lived through. And I assume Joe Dante lived through these 13 days in October that, you know, terrified the nation. And I think the film does say a lot of, of very good things about the Cuban Missile Crisis because it doesn't really try to overwhelm you with the TikTok of the details. It doesn't try to get into, you know, oh, there was the the YouTube bomb, uh, a plane that was shot down, and then there was the um, the the blockade. There was this question of whether or not. I mean, there's just a lot of scary moments I could have really gotten into. You know, you mm-hmm. mentioned earlier about how lucky we were. Um, you know, there, there were literally a period where, uh, there was a submarine that was told if they were attacked, they should unleash their nuclear weapons against the United States. It was a Russian ballistic missile submarine. The United States Navy was told that they needed to not allow any ships through. So they did a bunch of depth charges. The people on the, on the submarine thought those depth charges were torpedoes and they were told to fire their weapons. But it took one person who was in charge in that command structure there to essentially say, no, I think we're going to, we're not really under attack, you know, not turn the key. And there was a debate about that. That person got in trouble, uh, but they prevented a nuclear war. You know, there were all those kind of questions. Uh, I think the movie does a good job of not trying to get into those weeds too much, because really the concern is the fear as it's being manifested by the kids. Right. It's about that dream moment in the in the middle of the movie. Right. It's about everyone kind of falling in line, and then one girl in the hallway 
telling you the truth and you don't want to hear it. And so she's a communist. The movie works really well, and it could have maybe failed if it tried to get into those particular details, which I could see a movie trying to do that and not particularly doing very well. Agreed. So we, we've uh, we chatted a bit about kind of what we think about it, but let's put this on onto paper here. Uh, I always do a rating system when we do our, our episodes, um, usually one to five, so it's consistent across all the things that we talk about. But since we get super critical about the content, I like to get super critical about the rating too. So I've uh, crunched the numbers, I've tailored this for this film, and let's do one out of five free passes to one of Lawrence Woolsey's movies. Uh, if you have just one free pass, you have to sit there alone or be stuck um, in the guy in the, in the bug costume, you know, by yourself. But if you have five or so movie free movie passes, you can invite your little brother, your high school crush, and hey, even their parents too on your date. How many uh, free passes to one of Lawrence Woolsey's movies would you give matinee? Uh, I mean, this was such a formative movie for me that I almost feel bad giving it this, but I have to. It's a five. It's a five. I want five free passes nice. to the next Woolsey movie. I want to take the whole crowd and I want us to get to get buzzed <laughs> and frightened by Yatamo Vision um, and then walk out into the cold light of day and realize that we're safe and everything's okay. Nice. I, I'm going to give it a four. I think... It didn't have, you know, it's a movie probably if I would have seen it when I was younger. I didn't see it until probably I think it was maybe college when I first kind of saw this on TV. It's it's really good. And I think if I watch it again, I'll probably, the more I think about it, it's going to raise up a little bit high. Five to me are those kind of perfect films. Uh, and it's not there, but it's really good. It's one that I would incredibly recommend people to check out. So I, I'm glad um, you recommended it here for us to to watch. Anything else you want to recommend to our listeners is normally where we do this, where we, if people are interested in this, they want to read something or watch something. Maybe it's related to matinee. Maybe it's just something in the genre. Anything you want people to check out? Yes. I've got some, I have some weird, I have some weird recommends. Ooh, those are the guests. Um, kind. <laughs> so, uh, first of all, Joe Dante's Gremlins 2. I'm just going nice. to, as just, everyone should see Gremlins 2. Even if you've never seen Gremlins 1, it doesn't matter. Not needed. Gr no, it's not. It's really not. Gremlins 2 is so odd and so wonderful and kind of really encapsulates like the kind of thing that Joe Dante can do that I want to recommend it. I know it's not atomic related, but I had to get it in. I wish it was atomic related. I want to talk about it on the I podcast. Know. Oh, can you, can you think of that? Atomic radioactive Gremlins? That'd be beautiful. That's how they should do Gremlins 3. <laughs> Joe Dante's just been directing TV for a while. Bring him back. Mm -hmm. Gremlins 3. My second two recommends are kind of like, I think, really good background information about these periods and like why the Cold War was conducted the way it was with regards to nuclear weapons. The first is a um, documentary by a gentleman named Adam Curtis. It's called To the Brink of Eternity. Uh, it's part of a larger documentary series called Pandora's Box, which is about kind of... Um, culture losing faith in science and scientists hmm. to the brink of eternity is specifically the stuff about like the Rand corporation and war games and kind of the people that it is alleged Dr. Strangelove, the person is based on and how they shaped cold war policy and how they shaped the way the cold war was conducted and the way America's nuclear arsenal was, was created. I think it's very good. It's got, a lot of interviews with very fascinating people you don't normally hear from. Uh, the other is a book by uh, Douglas L. Kinney. It's called 15 Minutes. Um, and it really focuses on Curtis LeMay, uh, Strategic Air Command, and kind of the beginning of America's nuclear uh, deterrence pre like ICBMs. My big selling point of the book is that I think I don't think enough people realize that there was a period in American history where deterrence meant that we had bombers armed with nuclear weapons in the sky flying above most of the world 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Many of the pilots were on speed <laughs> and they lost a lot of nuclear weapons. Uh -huh. There was crashes, uh they dropped them, they lost them. And that 15 minutes is a fascinating book that really covers like why that structure was put in place, who advocated for it, and like how we get to things like the Cuban Missile Crisis. So lucky, uh, so lucky throughout this. So lucky, arguably lucky. Repeatedly. We could lucky would have been not, not having the bomb, but um, yeah, yeah, arguably lucky. Um, those are great. I, 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 15 minutes is a great book. I have not, uh, heard of this documentary series. So now I, now I'm, I'm going to want to check that out. That's great. Thank you. I have three things as well. Uh, one is I want to recommend, uh, your vice series on, on nuclear war. Uh, one particular, the one from January 9th, 2020 
called How to Survive a Nuclear Bomb. I'll include a link to that. I'll recommend things as well. The movies we've covered on the podcast before, which we, we've already talked about, like Blast from the Past, and Them. Them is uh, such a perfect um, example of these kind of B-movie films. And it's also not a terrible movie by itself. Um, I watched it in the dark uh, when I rewatched it before the podcast, and it is pretty scary at, at points. Uh, and finally, I'll, I'll recommend a book by Barry Atkinson called Atomic Age Cinema, The Offbeat, The Classic, and The Obscure from 2014. Uh, that book is great. It's really about this history of B-movie films. Uh, they, you know, they talk about as the Atomic Age Cinema. Most of the films mentioned in there are not about, you know, radioactive induced monsters, but it's it really, because of how prominent that was in people's mind at that particular time period, really the, the dawn of the atomic age, it fits the genre and created its kind of own subculture. And one thing that's great about that book is the lots of colored pictures of the posters, which are just yeah, so beautiful. much fun to check out. Thank you so much for coming on, on this podcast. Any other places people can check out your work? I've already mentioned the War College podcast. What else can people uh, do to find some of your great work? I'm on Vice almost every day. Uh, you can... Follow me on Twitter at MJGAULT, and I that's where I, I post most of my work. And more in the Vice series on nukes is forthcoming. I will say that the COVID pandemic has completely changed my thinking about America's readiness for nuclear war mm-hmm. and survival in general. Um, and it has darkened it, which is awful, but it there it is. And there is a lot of similarities between reporting on a pandemic and reporting on nuclear weapons in a way in ways that i have found shocking matthew thank you so much for coming on the podcast let's t- talking in our respective bunkers uh, over zoom and uh, looking forward to, to reading the rest of those vice series tim thank you so much for having me on the show Thanks for listening to another episode of the Supercritical Podcast. If you have any suggestions for future episodes or you want to tell us what we got wrong, uh, either nuke-wise or maybe we uh, didn't do a good job of describing the science between a man uh, and hybrid, um, you a couple ways you can contact the show and let us know. I'm on Twitter at Nuclear Podcast. Do you have a Facebook page still? I'm thinking about getting rid of it, but we'll, it's still there for today. Facebook.com slash Supercritical Podcast. And the best way to contact me, uh, and it's always fun when, when people do, is email supercriticalpodcast at gmail.com. And until next time, this has been Tim Westmeyer and Matthew Gull. And remember, if it's pop culture and radioactive, we are bound to get supercritical about it. Have a good one.